All right, we're going to continue in section 9.3 today, applications and probability. We talked a little bit last time about odds, and if you'll remember, there's this relationship between odds and probability, where the odds of something is really a comparison of how likely it is to occur compared to how likely it's not going to occur. I wish I had some wonderful example with the coronavirus right now, because I'm feeling like I should have something for you for that, and I didn't do that, and I wasn't thinking ahead in advance, so sorry. So we're going to look at something I do already have planned, which is a three-child family. And we've drawn this diagram before. And if you'll remember, the way that it works is that we have a boy or a girl when we have the first child. Second child is boy or girl. And the third child, same thing, boy or girl. And all of these outcomes that is along each tree branch itself are equally likely because every tree branch says one half. And if we multiply each one of them, we get one eighth. So each one of these individual tree branches is a one eighth probability. Does that make sense? Okay, so either write out all the one eighths at the end, if you wish, or write out all the one halves in the middle. Either one of those would be fine. And I'll let you continue to do that. I'm just going to mark it like this for the moment, okay? But it actually wants us to know about comparing the odds of having all the same gender of children. So looking at the diagram, where are the branches that are all the same gender of children? Yeah, top and bottom, just like this, right? And so there's only two ways that you get all the same gender of children. And how many ways are there that you don't get all the same gender of children? Six because there, there were eight total. So as we're looking at that, this is a comparison, right? The comparison is a comparison that is, it ha we'll say it happens, right? It, it actually works it, it, compared to it not happening. Not happens. I can't do that. Does not happen. Okay. So you said two ways it happens, six ways it doesn't happen, and we would reduce that to one over three. So the odds of having the same gender of children, if you have three children, is one to three. It's not a probability, right? Probability is actually one out of four, but the odds are one out of three. If you're asking for odds in favor, and then you're asked for odds against, all you have to do is to flip the fraction upside down. Because odds against means that you're comparing when it does not happen to compare to when it does. Well, that's six compared to two, right? Which would be three compared to one, and you can't actually write that as three. It still needs to be written as a ratio to make sense for our context. So this is a three to one odds against. Yes? Does it have to be written as a fraction, or could it be written one? You can write it with the colon between. Okay. Yep. So you could also write it like that. That's very, very correct. Yep. And if it helps you to do that so that you don't forget to um, leave it in a fraction instead of changing it to a whole number, that's good. But don't forget that if you write it like that, you still have to reduce it. So you can't leave it as 6 to 2. It has to still be reduced. Okay. So changing gears a little bit, we have the other application of probability that this section is going to talk about. So the first application is odds. The second application is called expected value. Expected value, so if the possible outcomes in an experiment are A1, A2 to AN, with probabilities P1, P2 to PN, then the expected value is A1 times P1 plus A2 times P2 all the way up to AN times PN.
So I know that it looks like it's just a bunch of letters and numbers all just mushed together. Um, all of those components represent values. So these are all probabilities. So decimals, fractions, okay? That's what you're getting in those spots. The other ones are all outcome values that are numerical, like rolling the die, how many dots are on the top of the die, something you can count. So you can't use a head-tails experiment. It doesn't work in this context to talk, find, talk about expected value. But there are many things that you can use, like you can use tossing um, your, your dice. You can use um, counting numbers on a roulette wheel. We're going to do an example with a roulette wheel numbers in a minute. But so you're looking at numerical type of experiments when you're talking about this particular thing. Or another possibility is you're looking at something where you're doing a betting game. It's a gambling situation where an outcome, maybe it is an outcome of heads or tails, but what you're really saying is the outcome is you win and you earn money or you lose and you lose money. So those kinds of things are what we're talking about. A game is considered fair if the expected value is zero. Okay? It means you neither lose or you win, you come out even. That's what that's really saying. So taking a look at that, we're going to start with a roulette wheel example. So you may or may not be familiar with a roulette wheel. Um, a roulette wheel looks like a spinner, but it's a spinner that has 38 slots. The slots go from double zero up to 36, and they're colored in different ways. Um, so there's blacks and reds, I think, and I think that the zero and the double zeros are greens, something like that. So we're doing a, a simplified question associated with the roulette wheel, but just so you know that there's, there's color to the roulette wheel. The other thing that happens whenever you see, list, when I've seen them in my past, it's been a long while, but when they have the roulette wheel, they usually have a board up next to it that shows you what the roulette wheel has spun in the past however many spins that it's done. So it's like you're looking at the history of what's recently happened, which is interesting. So to start with, we're taking a look at probability as it's related to the roulette wheel. So what is the probability that you will land on zero, zero? One out of what? Close. 38. One out of 38. Because there's the numbers 1 to 36, and then we also have 0 and double 0. So there's 38 slots. What's the probability that you will land on 0? Yeah, still 1 out of 38. Any of those individual probabilities are the same. So the next question is actually a true scenario. 100% true. I got two of them in there. <clears throat> when my father-in-law, who is a very intelligent man in most situations, passes by the roulette wheel, he looks at the board. And if the board does not show a zero or a double zero in the past however many spins, he decides he's going to bet on it. I'm not joking. Because, I mean, it's bound to turn up because it hasn't done so recently. <laughs> There's some logic problem, right? Because these are supposed to be independent events, yes? The spins should not have any effect on each other. It's an independent thing. So what he does is he actually bets on both numbers. He'll put money down for the number zero and the number double zero. So he puts one chip on each of the numbers, and one chip is worth, we're saying for now, for our purposes, $10. We're wanting to know what the expected value of his bet is. Okay. So, um, I feel like, did I get, oh yeah, I, I glossed over it, I didn't say it out loud. Over here it tells you, um, if you win, if the ball lands on your number, you get 35 chips plus the chip you bet. I didn't actually say that, but it was there. Okay, so that's actually your winning amount. So, there's really only two outcomes in this scenario. You either win or you lose. Are you with me? I mean, like, that's how it is with any casino game. You Either you win or you lose. Now, your amount of winning might change or vary depending on what's going on, and that can happen in certain situations. So you think about when people are pulling this silly thing, you know, repeatedly, the, what do you call those? Slot machine, thank you. When they pull the slot machine, depending on what the slot machine shows, they might win different amounts of money for different combinations of things. So that could be the case. But that's not the case with the roulette pill. You either win or you lose. And so over here when we're counting on these, or counting these items for expected value, what we really have is we really have the value or the outcome expected, right? The value of winning 
times the probability that we win, and then the value of losing, I'll describe that a little bit better in a minute, and then the prob times the probability we lose. That's what we have. Okay, so let's take a look at each of these situations. Um, and you have to recognize as you're working through that he's paid some money to play the game, right? How much did he pay? How much? $20. He paid $20 because he paid for two chips. He put one chip on the zero, zero. He put one chip on the zero. He's guaranteed he's going to lose one of those chips. Even if he wins on one, he's at least going to lose one of those chips. Are you with me? Okay. So let's say he actually wins. It lands on one of those numbers. So if it lands on one of those numbers, he gets back 35 chips plus the chip he plays. So how many chips does he get back have now? 36 chips. And how much is that in money? $360. So he wins $360, but he paid 20. So he really only wins, what was it? 340. Okay, are you guys with me? Total amount that's given to him, and then you have to take away how much money he had to give to make that happen. Right? It's kind of like a profit loss thing, right? Your cost in, or your your um, profit and your net profit, those kinds of things, right? So the or not I didn't say that right. Your revenue and your profit. Revenue is how much money people give you, and then you have to take away your cost. Well, the twenty dollars was his cost to play the game, so his his profit is this revenue, how much they gave him back, minus the cost that he already put out. What is the probability that he wins? Okay, so why is it 2 out of 38, Michaela? He bet on two numbers. So he has 2 out of 38 probability that he wins. So what happens if he loses? Well, he's out some money. How much? He's out $20. So the value of losing is negative 20 because that's how much he costs to play and he doesn't get anything back. It cost him 20 bucks. What is the probability that he loses? Yeah, 36 out of 38. Like, it's pretty high, isn't it? <laughs> Grab a calculator. Because this is a numerical value in the end, I need to round the two decimals because we're talking money here, okay? So I need something that gives me a money amount at the end. And if you need to round, you round to two decimals, and you, you will need to round on this particular one. And you can have positives and negatives both, so. Do we get a value yet? No. Still working on it. What do you have, Kayla? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's negative. So what does that mean? Well, it's not fair. That's true. And not fair like my fifth graders say not fair. That's not what I mean. But it's not mathematically fair by our definition over here, right? The fair game's got an expected value of zero. It means that I'm equally likely to win and to lose. Here, it's not fair. And in fact, what this is really telling you is that on average you lose a dollar and five cents every time you play a game like this. That's an averaging thing, right? Like, it never is actually losing a dollar five. You know, you, I mean, a dollar and five cents, that's never what really happens. But on average, if you played this game, like the Bernoulli thing that we talked about, the Bernoulli's number, large numbers, law of large numbers, it was an averaging thing. That's the deal. If you played this a bunch of times, then on average, you would have lost a dollar five cents per game. Make sense? Okay. Let's look at another example. This is Deal or No Deal. Are you familiar with this show? 
Oh, so much fun. All right. In the television show Deal or No Deal, a contestant is down to two cases with equal probabilities of being chosen. The cases have $250,000 and $10. If you're the banker and you want to give a reasonable offer to the contestant, but not too lucrative, that means too enticing, right? Too much. What deal would you offer and why? So we're going to approach this like we're looking at the fair value amount, right? We're trying to do an expected value just like we did over here. Value of winning, value of losing, and so forth. So our expected value is going to be our value to win and the probability of winning and our value to lose and our probability of losing. So this is that same A1? Yep, A1. it is. It's just that in both the examples we've done so far, there's only two outcomes, winning or losing. You could have three outcomes, like let's say we did this and she has the option of getting three different cases, and so if she gets this case, she's going to get this value. If she gets this case, she's going to get this value. In this case, she's going to get this value. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reality is it's not even really the value of losing because she still would make something, just not very much on that other case, right? So maybe I shouldn't say the value of losing. I should say the value of the case one and case two. That might be a better way of describing this particular one because neither one actually loses us money. It just gives us a different value. So the value of one of the cases is the very nice $250,000. And what is the probability that the person gets that case? One half. Because it said equally likely, right? What is the value of the second case? Ten dollars. And again, the probability is one half. So you guys took quite a long time to tell me the last number, so I'm just going to give you this one. 125,005. <laughs> That's what it is. Okay? So we need to answer the question um, because it's sort of posing it in a funny way, right? It says, what would you give and why? Like, you have to describe what you did. Um, not what you did, but why you believe this is a value. So the issue or the answer really is um, you'd want to offer approximately $125,000, right? And more, slightly more maybe, would be better I didn't write that right. More would be a better. A better offer. For the contestant. That doesn't mean better in the sense that easier to choose. But it would be more profitable for the contestant on average. Less is better for the bank. So when it goes, do, 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 and it, pretty, it gives you that number, they're doing an expected value. That's what they're doing. And they're using that expected value to decide. And they're probably going a little higher or a little lower, perhaps depending on what they really want the contestant to do in terms of moving the game along. Okay? Interesting, right? Okay, I have one more example for you. I think we have just enough time to do it. It's a lottery example. Um, in a given lottery, we know that the odds, it says odds, of winning the lottery are 55 million to 1. Really need a coronavirus problem. <laughs> what is the probability of winning the lottery? Okay, they gave me odds and I need probability. So, that's right. <laughs> okay, so if the odds are 55 million to one, then the probability is one compared to 55 million, one. The tendency is to say 55 million because it's pretty close. And, you know, but but it's 55 million won because probability considers those who win and those who lose. The winner is the one, the loser is the 55 million. Are you with me? 
pool. If the grand prize is $14 million and tickets cost $5, is the game fair? So here's our expected value. We have the winning and the probability of winning and we have the losing, and we have the probability of losing. Okay, so if you win, what do you win? How much? You win 14 million, sort of. What do you really win? Do you know? Thank you, Rylan, you're right. You win 13 million, 999,995. Why? 90, not 95. Yeah, 90. It was $5 for the game, so 95. Yeah. Because it cost you five bucks to play the game, right? Only if you bought one ticket. Correct. If you bought one ticket. So you're we're right. Assuming you just bought one we're ticket. assuming you bought one ticket for the cost for playing for just one ticket. You're right. And then what's the probability that you won? One out of what? 55 million. One. All right, so if you lose, what do you lose? $5. So it's a negative 5 right here. That's the other outcome. There are only two outcomes. And what's the probability that you lose? $55 million over $55 million. One. One. Funny stuff, right? I mean, like, you might as well just say one. Gonna lose, gonna lose. Okay, so just so you know, this is actually equal to negative $4.75. <clears throat> the question asked is the game fair? No, why not? Yeah, no, because the expected value we just got does not equal to zero. It equals negative $4.75. So I want to show you a very interesting thing, thing that happens with lotteries um, that you don't really think about when people talk about them the way that they do. So the reality is, in many state lotteries, they say that the proceeds benefit education. Have you heard that before? Okay. Under these conditions, if the proceeds benefit education and one million tickets are sold, what is the expected value from the lottery sales? So, well, on average, we expect that when somebody, they have an expected value of 475 negative, right? They lose 475, the state wins 475. Are you with me? Every ticket sold has an expected benefit to the state of $4.75. So we're expecting as the state, the person that's collecting them, for our benefit to be 475, and we're going to sell 1 million tickets. So we would end up with $4.75 million. So 4,750,000. Okay? Fabulous. But that's not the actual value. That's the average over time kind of value, right? The real reality is that one of two things happens. Either no one wins, or someone wins, and they may split pots and things like that. I don't care, but at least someone wins. The 14 million gets, you know, farmed out, okay? Okay. So if no one wins, the reality is that each of the tickets was really $5. Are you with me? And it has a million tickets sold. So one option is that it's $5 million that the state gets. Like really and truly. Not in overtime, but at any given individual lottery event like that. But if someone wins, we still collected the same what was it, $5 million, I'll just write it as $5 million, right? We still collect the same $5 million, but then what do we have to turn around and do? Subtract $14 million. And do you see a problem? Yep, we're at negative 9. Negative 9 million. 
So our real reality is that we either gained five or lost nine million dollars. No one really wins, right? Either, so this is a really tricky thing, right? You're either like, yay, education, woohoo, and you're like, which means you're telling all the people winning the lottery, I don't want you to win. I don't want you to win. Don't win. Play the lottery. Don't win. Right? That's what you're saying. Or you're saying, yay, everybody has a chance and they can win and somebody's going to win and we're going to be really happy and then the money doesn't end up going to education for it. That's super tricky, right? Really strange stuff. So it's a funny thing with the lottery and how they sort of market it to make it palatable for people to want to do it or to want to have association with it in a state.